Thanks very much, Steve. So my name is Diana Bowman. I'm at the Stars Institute, which is a research institute for biomedical research. And there I have the pleasure of running the aquatic facility where we work with multiple invertebrates, aquatic species, as well as vertebrates, which does include zebrafish. Um, so I was also on the organizing committee and Zoltan and I put together with the committee a survey that we sent out. We advertised it at the recent zebrafish meeting in Madison and then also sent it out to throughout the zebrafish community through multiple channels. And so what we're doing here really speaks to Steve's point when he gave his introduction on the second objective of this workshop, which is learning about our current status, where we are. And we, we've all seen so far we're not very far. Um, that's a good starting place to know where you are to be able to build on it. So number of questions that were sent out. The first one was at what life stages do you use? We had 63 respondents to our survey, 63. And so if you look at the total here of 244, you can see that we had many, many groups who were using animals at all the different stages, from the embryos, the larvae, through the young adults, and through even to aging studies. And this, this really speaks to the diversity of studies and the complexity of research that is being done in zebrafish these days. It, we've moved well beyond the embryonic development beginnings, which is still very solid. But I was, I was really surprised, and if we just put that in graph form, at just how many varieties there were. Although, of course, the predominance, as you can see from the top two bars, is still on the embryonic work. But as was very nicely brought up in the, in the last comments, um, to get good embryos for good research, you need good breeders, and good breeders come from good nutrition, and we don't really know what's in that embryo and what's in that yolk sac unless we start defining things. The next question that we asked were what diets you do provide to your fish. And going back to the historical perspective that Chris provided for us, um, we did see out of our 63 respondents that Artemia came in highest from that traditional beginning of the Artemia, the brine shrimp, um, combined with the plate food. The majority of facilities in our respondents were using Artemia. Gemma came in next as the top used dry commercially available food, followed by Ziegler, and then next live food would be the rotifers. Now, many people, but not all, were using the rotifers in a polyculture. And this is where you start your larvae out in what looks like a green soup, where you have the larvae and the rotifers and rotifer feed all coexisting together, which removes that manual labor aspect to add some other challenges of its own, not to mention raising the rotifers in the first place. Flake food, still very popular, predominantly tetramine, but there were a number of other um, mentioned vendors and, and I shouldn't have done but I also threw in algae wafers which are being used by a few facilities into the flake food category to make that 17. Paramecia, the last of our live foods that came up, um, coming in at 14 of our respondents and so about 22%. Golden pearls came up as a similar number to Paramecia out of our respondents. That might well be because the, um, the master mix that's published on the Zerk website is actually a mix of the Ziegler spirulina and golden pearls. So I think that might raise the awareness of golden pearls, particularly in the, the US zebrafish environment. ZM is a diet out of the UK. There were some people that couldn't get hold of this but wanted to be using it. Uh, Sparos again came up much higher in the, the European survey that they're at Portugal and they will also make cust small batch custom feeds which a lot of vendors aren't able to do for us at this time. Spirulina, uh, Argent Hatch Fry and Capsulon for your fry and SDS, Specialized Diet Services, they all came in with smaller levels of usage and then there were ones the the, the very low frequency ones that just came up from one or two respondents. And that included krill, uh, the Ridley NID pellets, ceramicron, the hikari pellets, trout larvae food, tube effects worms, the immunopro and the caviar that we saw more predominantly in the European survey, 
Uh, salmon starter, freeze-dried bloodworms, mysis shrimp, which surprised me. I thought they were a bit large for zebrafish, but there was one lab reported that. And then a number of self-made diets, which I presume was some conglomeration of the previously stated ones. Our next question was, why did you choose the diets that you chose? And the largest response was based on experience. And this particularly is looking at the two things we've mentioned so far, both growth rate and the fecundity fertility. And you need both, because it's no good having wonderfully 100% fertile embryos if you've only got five. So you need to have a good number of embryos with also a good viability. Survival was also listed, but not nearly as much as growth and the fecundity fertility. Along with that also was just what's worked in the past. We've already heard that, you know, don't break something that's already working. Recommendations from others was a large reason why people were doing what they were doing. They'd either moved labs and brought it with them. It's what they were trained to do. A couple of people, Christian, referenced your 2012 aquaculture paper as the real reason for doing what they were doing. Um, other literature searches were mentioned. Talking to colleagues and also vendor recommendations. So the people that put in the housing systems were advising on what foods to be used in their housing system. So I was interested to see that one come in as well. Next reason for using a food was cost, ease, availability. Um, ease definitely plays into trying not to use the live foods because of the massive amounts of manual labor involved with that. Um, availability, certainly there were some diets that there were some labs couldn't use because of the location they're currently in and they couldn't get diets that are made in other countries. So that played in as well. Food composition, 13 groups out of 63 mentioned food composition. So fairly low on, and again, reflecting a lot of what we've seen today, that it's more important what we see as an output rather than what we know is going in as an input. Um, those that did mention food composition, um, the only component that was specifically mentioned really was protein being of concern by groups. Other. This is where we already see one of the challenges that Christian mentioned um, coming into play, which was being for the food being able to work with the equipment you use, um, particularly for those labs that are lucky enough to have the automated feeders. Some foods work much better in the automated food feeders than others do with you know, clogging and again issues. So that definitely came into play. Um, particle size based on the growth of your fish was definitely a big issue in determining which foods are life stages. Also, relating to equipment, there was one group that talked about some foods leading to much more mold growth in a tank than others, so looking at what that food does in your system if you have overfeeding. Enrichment definitely came up here as a topic. There were a number of groups that wanted to stay with a live food because of the enrichment aspect of the natural behaviour. So those were some of the categories coming in. There was one group, um, a lot of groups talked about providing variety. There was one group, they said, but well, we did a survey and we talked to a lot of labs and every individual lab said that what they were doing was the best. So we just took the combination of every food they were using, mixed them all together and that's our mix. So that was a, a novel approach. Um, our next question, oh, and, and six of the groups that responded did talk about their own in-house trials to determine what would be the best food input for their research fish. The next question was, how often are your fish fed per day? And you can see that if I graph that out, twice per day came out the most common, but uh, there was also, this is other. So combinations of above. So some groups, many, many groups, in fact, feed different life stages, different amounts of food. And the most common being that the juveniles get more than the adults. So if we look at what came up in the text responses to this answer, we find that a number of facilities feed less on the weekends. It's going back to the manual labor aspect and having staff or students available on the weekends to do that. So those facilities that normally feed twice a day would go down to once a day on the weekend. 
There were other permutations as well, such as if they fed two types of food, they put them both in the same feeding instead of at different times of day on the weekend. Um, or they wouldn't do any live foods on the weekend. They'd only do dry foods on the weekend. So a number of variations there. But automated feeders, those with automated feeders have the capacity to feed many more times in a day than those with manual labor only. And facilities where they only have some racks with the automated feeders and some racks fed by manual labor, um, the racks with the automated feeders were receiving a lot more food, feedings, not necessarily food, but a lot more feedings than the racks that were fed manually. And so again, then it comes to determining which fish you have on which racks and needs for those studies. Stage of life, definitely there were a lot more groups that were feeding um, the juveniles and the, the high growth rate groups, the larvae and juveniles, than were feeding the adults. There were also a number of groups that fed their breeders more than their maintenance. And we, you've heard about that in the mice with the growth diet and the maintenance diet. And so a common thing was that adults would get fed one or two times a day, juveniles would get fed three or four times a day. And then those groups feeding their breeders would give their breeders one extra feeding a day. There was one lab that talked about the transition of going from the growth feedings, that lab fed four times a day, down to the adult two times a day. And they actually did a two-month transition, 4X, 3X, 2X. Most people, I think, just hit a certain day's post-fertilization and just do the switch from 4X to 2X or 3X to 2X. The next question that we asked was, how much are your fish being fed? Um, large variants, uh, answers varying from no standard to controlled measured amounts per fish and per um, number of fish in the tank, because that is also going to affect it based on how many fish they're interacting with and their levels of activity and behavior will determine that consumption as well. So. The highest predominance of answers was whatever they consume within a few minutes. But there were also combinations of said results as well. A lot of the comments came up relating to stuff we've already heard. So if you have rotifers being raised in a polyculture environment, they have that ability to feed continuously. The juveniles get more, the breeders get more. And then those that did actually give a specific number said that it was between 1 and 4% body weight was where they were aiming at for the amount in a single feed. We finished off again by looking at interest in participation in intra-laboratory research. And this slide was looking at the desire to determine the nutritional requirements. And the majority, again, putting it in graph form, the majority was strongly in favor. We've got over half of our respondents there. And if you include the agree, agree with support and maybe, we're looking at 87% of our respondents were interested, but the majority of them would require support, whether that was in funds or free test diets to test. But there's a, there's a lot of interest there. And tying in with that, our final question was looking at whether they'd be interested in developing and testing a basic defined diet for zebrafish. Again, very high amount of yes. If you look at the top three bars, that gives us a 92% of our respondents were interested. Again, the majority would need support in some way or another. But it does show that there's a tremendous amount of interest in our community, not just in having a defined diet, but in helping develop that defined diet. And so whilst I agree that this is a self-selected subset that responded of those that did respond, we have a, a, a lot of people behind us here in wanting to look at this. So with that, I'll hand over to Zoltan to give us some updates from the Thanks for having me today. Um, you know, it actually plays out really well because I'm really curious now to see after I put together my slides where we fit in. I have no clue, right? <laughs> um, I really would like to give this presentation with the 
thought in, back, in the background that we're just another zero to share. We're one of the many, and we have no food. Or maybe we have a little, but not much. Okay, so our mission is we're a genetic resource center. We have wild type, uh, transgenic mutant zebra fish. And our purpose is to acquire these, maintain these, and redistribute these. So researchers don't have to do that, right? <coughs> Instead of spending their research dollars on researching international shipping documents, we do that for them, and the money they save goes to research. In a nutshell, that's our mission. All right. Now, because our day-to-day -day operations are so centered on customer service and client service, it's really, really hard for us to devote consistent time into researching new things. Yet we're in a peculiar situation that because of our health services, we also consult with a lot of um, researchers and research facilities about the fish health and how they run the, the fish facilities, and that includes feeding. And we may not be the best, you know, advisor, right? but that's why we're here to learn, right? So the first thing I want to talk about is our food. And as Diana already pointed out, um, what we have is a mix of foods. And the idea behind this is that for each life stage, we recognize the gape of the larvae, the gape of the juveniles, and that of the adults changes. And so there's a limit of what they actually can ingest without too much effort. So from the get-go, we have a larval mix. Does this work? No. No, okay. So we have a larval mix, which focuses on the smallest food sizes, but it is also a mix of different um, food sizes, and it includes rotifer diet, um, which is mixed in with Ziegler diet in equal parts. The juvenile mix is, again, different particle sizes of Ziegler diet and golden pearls. And the master mix is a mix of adults, uh, Ziegler diet, spirulina, and golden pearls. And in the olden days, before I was at the, at the ZERP, our veterinarian um, looked at what information was available from vendors and then decided to use information that was available to put together something that looked like a complete diet, right? May not be, but that was the idea. <coughs> So what we do is we take these bags, we mix them, and break them up into um, portions that we can feed within a week or two, and then we vacuum seal and store them in the freezer. We also feed paramecia and then artemia, and uh, um, paramecia mainly for the larvae, and then also uh, artemia for larvae and for adults. Um, we know that artemia are essentially like sausage and bacon for the zebra fish. They have very little nutritional value. Um, so we feed them as enrichment. At least that's what we tell our ICO. The fish will crave when they see something like moving. And so they obviously, you know, have the hunting instinct. And so we keep feeding that as a complement to the other diets. Okay, so the goal of mixing the dry feeds is to compensate for potential uh, deficiencies and um, based on the information that actually was available from suppliers, we tried to make a complete list of vitamins, trace elements, protein, amino acids, fats and pigments. And uh, of course we want to support all the different life stages and it's especially important the transition between various um, life stages, for example from larvae to juveniles. So that's one thing. Change gears here. So this is the information that was available in 2005, for example, for Zika diet. And this is on the on the right side is what is available today. And of course now they list much, much more ingredients. We could probably say we can we could get away only with Zika because they probably have a complete diet, but do we really know? Also, there are some things that we suspect might not belong in the fish food, like poultry, byproduct, 
Hyrule's Pony Feather Meal. I'm not sure if that is, um, you know, what we should be feeding. All right. So now, how do we feed? We have several different feeding strategies. We have little spoons. These are 3D printed spoons. And you can go to Thingiverse, you can download the CAD, and you can do that on your own um, 3D printer. You can adjust the size of the, of the spoon. And what you see here is actually part of a um, feeding test that we um, started recently in spite of all our shortcomings. Um, Use your mouse, click on next. Your maps. Oh, next. Oh. Okay, then we have a wonky old feeding gum, that's how we call it. You can see the central parts have different sized holes, and then um, the, this can be pushed through the feeding hole to dispense a certain amount of food. So the volume of the spoons and the size of the hole helps us control the amount that we put into each tank. And we try to make it such that per tank, you know, we try to dispense a certain amount of food per fish in the tank. And we also aim for about 3% body weight measured at zebra fish that are six months old. Okay. And then most recently, we started going high tech using. Um, Arduino and, and uh, Raspberry Pi um, technology, such as here, this little uh, motherboard. And we 3D printed another food gun, which uses an auger to dispense food. And the food would be dropping down from this falcon tube into the auger, and then would be dispensed here at the front. This is con uh, computer controlled. Raspberry Pis are many computers. And uh, this is the thing in action, actually. There's a little movie that I can show for those who are interested. And then the goal is to have actually on our barcodes for each tank a little extra QR code, which indicates nothing but the number of fish in there. And the, the food gun reads the barcode and dispenses the appropriate amount of fish that we, we determine in that tank. So now, does that work? It, it yeah. works. It works in principle, but we have to do more work on it. Okay. It's not pretty, let's put it that way around. Okay. It's not pretty, but it works. So um, recently we did find uh, a little time that we could commit to testing foods. What I told you about these, these food mixes go back almost 15 years now. And um, yes, you can put us into the camp. What ain't broken, you know, don't try to fix it. But in all realistic, you know, we have to do something about the uh, progress that has been made and that, that is available in terms of food. And so what we have here is now six test groups of food side by side in our facility. And we're testing three doses each day. So, for example, the red label food um, would be one type of food and we feed it once, twice or three times per day. Right. And we do that six times parallel. And then we want to learn about uh, the growth curve that these fish experience, the weight curve. We want to look at fecundity and breeding. And then we also want to look at uh, general health of the zebra fish, which includes adipose tissue and or resistance to certain pathogens. And um, so this is, how, this is how it looks in real life. So we have these tanks nicely labeled, and the food and the spoons are labeled accordingly, and that removes all bias. In principle, we shouldn't know what food it is, except I do, unfortunately. And then um, the result for the three-month um, feeding um, looks like this. So we have the six different um, food types. There's a red label in there, um, and this is our starting point. We started feeding when the fish were one month old. They were 13.6 milligrams then, and since then they have gained um, mass. This is only the mass of the um, fish, and this is for one times feeding per day, twice per day, and three times per day. You can see that the different diets play out in different ways, and we actually learn something from them. The most um, interesting part is that the physical characteristics of the food 
really make a big difference. For example, in our tanks, as soon as we drop the food from the spoon into the tank, the water that drops into the tank and the air that bubbles into, from the tank creates a vertex and it pulls the, uh, the food backwards and into the siphon, much as, as um, Chris described. But some feed stay in the water column longer and others drop to the bottom like a storm. And when that happens, the fish will forage from the bottom, but not extensively. However, they will go crazy about the food that stays in the water column. And so feeds that are very successful, like the yellow and the blue, they are feeds that float well and stay in the water column long. And our own diet, which is the red, that's the Ziegler mix, Vedatinia, and then just Ziegler flakes back here, is actually not performing that well as these other more modern feeds that have been developed recently. Right? Yeah. So this is how we learn and how we adapt our feeding strategies in our feeding program. And um, hopefully it will be something that can contribute to the community. Sultan, I'm sorry, there's Thank another you. chart. Is that male and female weight? Uh, we have, so we have scored males and females separately, but this is now just a summary. Males and females across the board. What was the orange and blue food? <laughs> you keep it secret. I keep it. I, I want to keep it secret because this is the first time point. Well, I can I can tell you. Okay. It's 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 sparrows and it's olohimi. Okay. So Gemma didn't Gemma didn't make it to the top round. Huh? Didn't make it because it is a heavier food and the fish don't feed as well on it as on the lighter floating feeds. Okay. So Gemma is actually the pink. Oops, here, Gemma is the pink. Our Ziggler flake only is the yellow. Um, Ziggler with Artemia is coming in under that. So what we learn from that is Artemia actually dilutes the nutrition you know, value of whatever we put into the tank. And then we have Otohimi and um, Otohimi and uh, Star of Zebra feed on top. And then we have an experimental food from a good friend um, that is very heavy and sinks to the bottom like a stone, as I described. But would normally suggest that it should grow uh, the larvae really well. So physical characteristics of the food seem to be important. All right? What are the times of eating three times? Say again? What are the times of feeding? OK, three times. Uh, the first feeding is 9 AM. Second feeding midday noon, and then the last feeding we're trying to stretch out as far into the evening as we can. Anywhere between anywhere between three to five six p.m. Thanks. Questions again? We can take one or two questions, and then we need to move. I'm a zebrafish researcher. I have a naive question about feeding zebrafish and the food. So when you're feeding the food, it goes in the water, is the assumption that you're feeding the amount that the zebrafish will eat in a reasonable amount of time? Because my simple understanding is if the food sticks around for a long time, doesn't get eaten, somebody said it's going to you know, cause a sludge. And then wouldn't it ultimately dissolve? And the nutrients then be all, they're swimming through everything now. I mean, how how do you, what assumptions are made when you're feeding? The, the, there's two there's two responses here. When we started feeding the larvae, in the first week, uh, we saw the sludge, and then it broke down and went away. And so what happens there is, when we feed with the spoon, we feed the same 80 milligrams per day uh, per per feeding um, to the larvae and to the one-year-old fish. And what it does is it feeds the larvae 12% or 10% of their body weight, and the old ones about 1.5% of their body weight. And it averages out to three, around six months of development. But clearly, we're overfeeding the young. Okay? So all these things are going to the design of this. this, this. Yeah? Yes. One of the biggest challenges with overfeeding on the assumption, hey, there's just food in there, they can self-dine, 
is that because it goes into a recirculating system, it then severely impacts your water quality, mm. your filter changes, and hence more manual labor and other aspects of the recirculating system. And so overfeeding is, is usually a recipe for disaster. And here, again, we might be different. We were just discussing this. Our facility was built at a time when these water systems weren't very efficient. We have a huge amount of water volume. You know, our pollutant equilibrium is so stable, you can, I don't know, you can do a lot of it before you see a little pH um, variation. Other systems are much smaller in the volume, and so when you feed, you will see, for example, sludge build up right away, and it will impact the biofilter much, much more than it does ours. Thank you. Yeah, right. Oh, well, moving on. I was just going to ask, are you, are you checking for health parameters as well? Because optimizing the growth, you know, as, as has been mentioned, is not necessarily good for the fish in yeah. the long term. So we have a staff veterinarian, <laughs> and part of our services is a, is a health service, a diagnostic health service. And when the fish are uh, nine months old, she will look at adipose tissue development, at general infection rates, and those kind of things. Uh, pretty much part of our routine, um, not, the, not the adipose tissue, but the infection rates, pretty much part of our routine um, health monitoring in the facility. Okay. 